Um, so uh, let me get started uh, with our third one. This is models of words. Um, I expect that people have mostly done the reading, but at the very beginning, I'm going to kind of summarize the reading and give a few of my thoughts on it. Um, and then hopefully people can use that as an opportunity to ask questions or uh, uh, for elaboration on things you uh, you didn't catch in the reading materials. But um, so we're going to talk about, um, oops, sorry. Um, what we want to know about words. So basically, um, there's a lot of different things that we might want to know about words for NLP applications or whatever. Um, in the first one uh, could be, are they the same part of speech? So are these words nouns or verbs or whatever? Um, do they have the same conjugation? Uh, are they a past tense verb, a present tense verb? Uh, uh, do they have the uh, a particular case or whatever? Um, do these two words mean the same thing? Are they synonyms or do they mean opposite things? Are they antonyms? Um, uh, or do they have some sort of semantic relation? Like are they is a, in is a relation or are they part of uh, went to school at, etc. cetera? Um, so one uh, manual attempt that has been very, very successful at doing this is WordNet. Um, there's lots of others, but WordNet is basically something like this. Uh, the main thing is that it captures is a uh, relations. Um, so we have artifact at the very top. This is spelled the strange Australian way because we got it from NLTK. But uh, um, if you ignore that, uh, we have artifact at the top. Um, then we have motor vehicle. Then we have motor car. Then we have uh, a compact car, a hatchback, and a gas guzzler, which are all types. Um, so. This is a one way to get information about words, but it's a very, very major effort to develop it. And uh, this was developed, I believe, at Princeton for uh, you know twenty years, and it still continues to be developed. Um, and oh yeah, and there are projects in many languages. So there's uh, word nets in many other languages as well. Um, and what we would like to do is uh, hopefully we can do something similar, uh, more complete, and with less effort. Uh, so um, WordNet will always have uh, advantages of being manually curated and very nice. Uh, uh, you know, that it will be accurate when it exists, but we would like to uh, cover things in a more complete way. So the answer, which you read about in the uh, in the reading is word embeddings or word vectors or word representations, whatever you want to call them. Um, so we have a continuous vector representation of words uh, that looks something like this. And uh, within the word embeddings, hopefully the features of syntax or semantics or whatever might be included uh, within. Um, so for example, element one uh, here might be more positive for nouns. Um, or element one and element three and element seven, if you put them in that direction, it might be indicative of a noun or something like that. Um, element two might be more positive for animate objects, and element three uh, might have no intuitive meaning whatsoever, which is actually the case for probably most of the things in this vector. Um, it probably has a meaning, but you know, not, it's not interpretable. So, um, so word embeddings are cool. This is the obligatory slide that you have to do whenever you introduce word embeddings. So yay, king minus man plus woman equals king. Uh, sorry, king minus man plus woman equals queen. Um, you know, this is a slide that probably most people in this class have seen before, or a thing that most people in the class have seen before. But this is really cool, I think. Uh, you know, with WordNet, it's not entirely clear whether you would have been able to do something like this. Uh, say, what is the female equivalent of, uh, of king? Or what is, uh, you know, what is the plural of king? You could uh, maybe do this, but um, the fact that this just falls out of the data uh, is, uh, is very interesting, I guess. Um, yeah. Oh, so that's what I just said. Um, so how do we train word embeddings? Um, there's a or how do we get word embeddings for whatever application that we'd like to do? There's a lot of different ways. These were covered. Um, so a very common way to do it uh, is initialize randomly and then train jointly with the task that we care about. So this means we don't have to do any extra work. 
uh, and we just train them like the language model that I talked about before. Um, the second one, and this is actually quite rare, I think, uh, it's not very common to do this, is you have some supervised task where you created annotation data, like part of speech tagging, um, and then you can test it on another task, uh, for example, parsing. Uh, this was cited in the paper, but I actually don't know of very much work that has done uh, something like this. And much more commonly, we have uh, pre-trained on some unsupervised tasks, so we don't actually care about this task very much at all. Um, but then we use it on uh, we use it on another task that we do care about. Um, so th that's it for the intro. Were there any questions of uh, stuff up until now? Or pretty straightforward, I think. Okay. So I'll uh, I'll move on to the next part. So unsupervised pre-training of word embeddings. This is also a, a summary of the reading materials that I'll go through. Uh, I'll go through just in case. Um, with some code examples of how you actually do this, uh, how you actually implement this. So um, first thing, I'd like to clear up a little bit of terminology. And the book here actually, I think, was not super clear on this distinction. So um, this is my, uh, one, one thing that you might notice about me as the class progresses is I really care about terminology uh, because I think terminology is important uh, in making kind of organizing your thoughts. And this is one place where I'll, uh, I'll talk about this. Uh, so distributional uh, and distributed are completely different things. Um, so distributional um, representations uh, are basically saying that words are similar if they appear in similar contexts. Um, so in contrast, you can think of non-distributional representations. And there's actually a paper by Manal Faraqui, uh, who is here. Uh, in, uh, called non-distributional word representations. And basically, this is something where you're not looking at the distribution of a word in a corpus um, and instead calculating it from something else. So like WordNet would be one example. Um, so it, distributional representations look at how the word is used in context, and non-distributional ones uh, would not do that. Then the other thing is uh, distributed representations. So distributed representations are basically word vectors um, that have lots and lots of different features for the word. And um, uh, that, that's what I talked about before. And the contrast would be local representations. Um, and this is something like a one hot vector, uh, for example, uh, which it, or a symbol. Um, so the, this is what these two terms uh, mean in general. Um, any, any questions about this? Good. Um, so this is an example of a distributional, uh, of why distributional web representations work. So we have a little code example in the code examples here called uh, kwic.py. Does anyone know what kwic stands for? Yeah? Keyword and content. OK, uh, exactly. Keyword in context. Um, wh where did you hear that? Oh, boy. That's a linguistic kind of yeah. tool. <laughs> okay. Yeah, OK. So th this, is a, this is a word that people in corpus linguistics will definitely know. Um, it's a very common thing. And what they do is basically you take a keyword and you show the things on either side of the keyword. And you can see Pittsburgh uh, has communications Pittsburgh acquired. Um, a Pittsburgh firm, uh, Mr. Allen's Pittsburgh firm, uh, and then you also have a Cleveland merchant from Cleveland to San Antonio and Cleveland districts, et cetera. And you can kind of see that the contexts around it indicate that it's a city or, or something like that. You can also see that University of Pittsburgh is very common, and Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh is not very common. So uh, we need to try a little bit harder to get, uh, get ourselves in the Wall Street Journal more often. OK, but anyway, um, so um, people who are doing corpus linguistics use this keyword in context thing a lot because it is very useful for humans. And it's also very useful for computers as well. Um, you can try this out with your favorite words uh, in the corpus if you want. Um, so then up until very recently, um, there were lots of uh, count-based methods uh, that basically um, uh, calculated these distributed representations by counting up contexts. And 
Uh, these were also covered in the uh, in the material reading materials. But create a word context count matrix, uh, count the number of occurrences, uh, maybe weight them with something like pointwise mutual information, maybe reduce the dimensions using SVE. Uh, and um, measure their closeness uh, using cosine similarity or jacket similarity or something like that. So um, th this is nice. It's relatively scalable because you're just counting things over a big corpus. Um, and yeah, these, uh, these methods exist. Um, there's a good survey of this in 2010, or maybe two good surveys of this in 2010, one by Turney and Pantel, uh, the other Sorry, I'm forgetting off the top of my head, but you can take a look uh, at all the examples there. Uh, they're cited in the book. And then the prediction-based methods are uh, the ones uh, like word to vec uh, that use something similar to neural networks. So that's one we'll uh, handle more. Um, so we tried to predict something uh, using a task that we don't really care about, and then the word embeddings are the byproduct. So we've already covered language models in the class. And this is kind of the, the first way that people created prediction-based uh, word embeddings. So this is my thing from the previous, uh, my slide from the previous lecture. Um, so basically, if we look here, uh, where are our word embeddings in this slide? Yeah, so the, the look up up here and one more place. Uh, uh, cl close, but not quite. What, what? Any, anybody else? W? Yes, exactly, W. So um, we, we have uh, the lookup word embeddings, and then we also have the output word embeddings. And as I mentioned last time, we can share these uh, as well um, and make one big thing of word embeddings. So if you train a language model, you get, uh, you get word embeddings for free, basically. Um, so if you think about what a language model is doing, it's also kind of doing something like a keyword in context. Um, so we have giving a and then x. And it's looking at the left context and then predicting this word. So it's like keyword in left context, basically. Um, but um, there's also other methods, uh, like the ones used in word to vec uh, which actually bring us closer to the, uh, the keyword and context thing that I showed before. So um, if we don't need to calculate the probability of the sentence, we can think of other more direct methods to do this. Um, yeah, so closer to the contexts uh, that we used in the keyword and context thing and closer to count-based methods. Um, yeah, and these try for word to vec etc. So the first one is uh, the SIBO method that you saw um, in the reading materials. And basically, to make it a little bit more uh, graphical, I guess, uh, you could, what you're doing is you're looking up uh, all of the surrounding words. Um, you're adding them together into a vector. And then you're using this vector to basically predict a score um, here. And uh, this score can be used uh, to calculate a probability and predict the words. Um, the reason why I wrote it this way is to kind of equate it with the language models and so we can see what, it, what we're doing similarly and what we're doing differently. So I guess there's two big differences here um, between this and the language model that I showed before. Um, are, are people, so what, what are the differences? Yeah, exactly. We can look at the future is one big difference. So we're looking at at and the. And what's the other thing? Addition or concatenation. Yeah, exactly. Addition or concatenation. So um, here we're adding everything together. And in the other place, we're concatenating things together. So um, the reason why addition, um, why concatenation is good is because, as I mentioned before, knowing which word came two words before versus what, which word came one word before is useful information. But if we're, learning, um, if we're learning word embeddings, we might not actually care about our prediction accuracy too much. So this is, uh, this is a way to do things uh, that allows us to do it without worrying 
um, that allows us to be more efficient, basically. Um, yeah, oh, and then we calculate the loss uh, given, the, given the thing over here. So we can, uh, we can take a look. We have a code example for this. Um, so you will see in your, um, oh, sorry. You'll see in, um, in the code example directory, um, we have, uh, let's see, uh, word, word mcbo.py. And this will look very, very similar to uh, the language modeling example that you saw before. Um, basically, the only difference is um, there's only a couple differences. The main thing is this uh, calculate sentence loss function. So what we have here is um, we have a sentence. We're taking in the sentence. This is word uh, IDs, basically. Um, and then we pad it on either side with, uh, with something of size n. And then we look up the word embeddings for all of the, uh, all of the n uh, things on or all of the words in this padded sentence. Um, then we, this is our kind of, uh, our matrix that we use to calculate the softmax. Um, and then we have a loss for every word in the sentence. Um, and then we step through every word um, in the sentence. Uh, we have this kind of strange range thing here. And the reason why is because we have padding on either side. So we basically step step through only the real words in here and we ignore uh, the words over here. Um, then we, uh, we add up, oops, sorry. We add up the things on, uh, on either side. So this is uh, the red vector add up thing here. And then we append uh, a loss where we do prediction. Um, so you'll notice in the materials that we had things about negative sampling and stuff like that, and we're actually going to cover those in, uh, in much more detail next time. So right now here, I'm, I'm still calculating the, uh, the softmax uh, as is. Um, and then another thing is that now um, we actually care about our embeddings. We're actually going to output them uh, into, uh, so we can use them for a later task. So here at the very end, we have a thing where we save out the embedding files. Uh, and you can, uh, you can open them up if you run this. So um, yeah, that, that's uh, the main difference. We're still training this on the Pentry Bank uh, corpus and stuff. So you can try that out if you'd like. Um, any questions so far on this? Um, so we can move on to the next one. Um, the next one is, uh, the skip gram model. So the skip gram model is actually, um, very similar to the SIBO model. The only difference is that instead of predicting each word in the context, given the word, or instead of predicting the word, given its context, we're predicting the context given the word. Um, so what that looks like is basically we do a lookup here. Um, we multiply this lookup by a weight matrix and get our scores. Um, and then uh, we calculate the loss for all of the surrounding words uh, based on this. Um, and these are kind of the two, the two models uh, that are used in word uh, which are the kind of uh, popular ones here. So I, I, I'll spare you the details. You can take a look. Uh, you can take a look at the code here. It's uh, really quite quite similar. But um, uh, I didn't actually run both of these and see which one gave us better results on the the corpus here. Um, but I, I think the consensus is that they're pretty similar, and SIBO works a little bit better sometimes. But uh, there, there's not a, a big difference between them. 
Um, and then there's other, other notes. So um, there's a very nice paper by uh, Omir Levy and uh, Yoav Goldberg that basically analyzes the Skipgram objective and derives uh, basically the ideal uh, form of this. Uh, are people famil familiar with this paper at all? Um, looks like, what, what's that? Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Or they show that the objective that you're optimizing is, uh, is similar to the objective that you're optimizing based on a matrix factorization where each element of the matrix looks uh, something like this, where k is the number of negative samples, uh, which, I, as I said, we're going to talk about next time. But it, it's interesting because um, the, unlike most neural networks, the uh, Skipgram objective and the SIBO objective are so simple that you can actually go in and do this analysis and say these are, you know, uh, these are basically the same. Um, the major difference is that um, you would need to do a big matrix factorization here, and, uh, and for SIBO and SkipGram, you're not doing a big matrix factorization. You're just skip stepping through the corpus. Um, I don't think anybody has, or well, to my knowledge, people have not uh, tried this uh, extensively, but um, I, my guess is that they would obtain very similar results. And um, there's other estimation methods, uh, actually lots and lots of estimation methods. The most popular one is GLOVE. Um, basically what this is doing is this is looking at the distributions and optimizing it in a different way um, that is slightly uh, or a bit more efficient and sometimes works well. Um, as uh, written in the book and kind of my intuition and uh, experience says, the optimization method is kind of secondary uh, to how you pick your context and how you decide um, decide what you're predicting as opposed to uh, how you predict it. Um, and also secondary to how big your data is or how good your data is. So that brings us to the next thing, which is what contexts do we use? So context has a large effect on um, on what your what kind of embeddings you're going to get. So. Um, this is very interesting. Um, so if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. So if you have a small context window, you get more syntax-based embeddings. If you have a large context window, you get more se semantics-based and topical embeddings. And if you have a, um, a context window based on syntax, so for example, you look at the parents or the children uh, according to a dependency tree, you get something that's more functional or something with words with the same inflection group together. Um, just focusing on the first two, do people understand why this is the case? Yeah. Um, so if you think about the words next to a noun, um, the words directly next to a noun will be like uh, of noun or a noun or something like that. So the words directly next to it will be very similar. Um, but if you look at the large context, it will be, you know, what is the general topic of the document that you're talking about. So how you adjust this makes a big difference. And actually, um, have people heard of brown clustering? Yeah? So brown clustering is this method from 1992 or something, uh, something like that. Um, and it's uh, a method for getting clusters, and it's based on this local n-gram uh, context, bigram context. Um, but actually, there's a section at the very end of the paper that says, oh, if you use a large context window, you can also get semantic uh, clusters and look at, uh, look at this as well. So apparently, this is, uh, this is something that's not just true for word -to It's true for all kind of models that induce clusters or something like that. So if you're thinking, uh, thinking about creating something there, you should, uh, you should definitely think about this. Um, and, any questions so far? That's the kind of uh, review part. No? Okay, so the evaluating embeddings part, um, this is going to be a bit broader than the reading materials. I'm going to cover some other things uh, that were not covered extensively there. Um, but basically, this is another thing where I'm a stickler for terminology. There's a, num a number of different types of in evaluation um, and also categorization of how you evaluate things. So 
you can think of intrinsic versus extrinsic evaluation. Um, this is something that many people might know here, but if you don't know, it's a very nice uh, distinction to know about. Um, so intrinsic evaluation is basically how good is the thing that you have. And the way you measure how good it is is by looking at it and uh, in measuring something, uh, something about its properties or something like that. Um, well, extrinsic evaluation is how useful is it in a downstream task, basically. You, uh, you try to use it to do something. And um, if you use it after you use it to do something, uh, if it works well for your task, then it's a good thing. Um, the second is uh, qualitative versus quantitative. This one I expect almost everybody to know. So qualitative, you examine the characteristics of examples. Uh, quantitative, um, you calculate some sort of statistics about it. And if the statistics are good, then it's, uh, then it's good. Um, so first, starting out with, um, with this visualization. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Can you give us examples of intrinsic and intrinsic? Yes, I am about to do that right now. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a first quiz, which will not be graded um, on, uh, on this. What, what is this? in the previous uh, categorization. So intrinsic versus extrinsic. Who says intrinsic? Yeah. And extrinsic? Yeah, intrinsic. And uh, qualitative versus quantitative. This is qualitative and quantitative. Yeah. Um, it's, it's basically qualitative, uh, qualitative intrinsic evaluation. So you're looking at the wor word embeddings. How good are they? And you're doing it in a subjective manner by looking at examples. So um, one way you can do this is um, by reducing high dimensional embeddings into a 2 or 3D visualization. Um, one example, this example is from uh, Mikolov's paper on word to vec And basically, you can see that if you reduce the word embedding space to a two-dimensional space and then pick out a few salient examples like China, Japan, uh, Beijing, Moscow, Tokyo, you can see that kind of the cities, or sorry, the, the countries are on one axis, the cities are on another axis. And interestingly, they kind of line up. Um, so this is one of the things I talked about, you know, like is capital of r r relationships are kind of showing up here. Things that are countries or cities are kind of showing up here also. So that's uh, interesting. Um, so there's a number of different ways to do projection. The most common is uh, principal component analysis, which is a linear uh, project projection into a low dimensional space. Um, another very popular option of uh, uh, another popular option to um, do visual visualization of word embeddings is uh, uh, I actually don't know how to pronounce the first one. The second one, everybody says Tisney. Uh, I don't know if the first one's just SNE, uh, but, um, but any, it's TISNE anyway. And the idea, the, you know, the basic idea is that you want to group things together that are similar in similar like local spaces in the space. So things that will be close together uh, locally will be close together after your uh, visualization. Um, and you can look at a, uh, an example of this. So here, we have, um, we have a projection of PCA, and this is not of a language data. This is of, uh, of uh, MNIST digits, which are images. Um, so you can see PCA, uh, it does tend to reduce images that are the same into kind of similar spaces, but there's a lot of overlap. But if you compare this with uh, what TISNY comes up with, uh, you can see the TISNY thing is much better grouped together, basically. You can see that. Uh, the, image, the same images, which are the same color here, basically get grouped into coherent uh, clusters in your visualization. Um, so this is a, a very popular option. Um, we've included a code example of this. Um, when you look at the code example, um, you can see basically, let's see, we can go back. Um, we have this uh, tisney.py thing. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the math here, but uh, you, can, you can take a look at it if you want. It's a good uh, example. 
Um, and then we have the, uh, the visualization, the Tisney visualization. And this, um, uh, basically, all it does is it calls this library. And um, we're randomly displaying, I guess, the top 1,000, was it? Or, um, uh, and then you can also specify a file of, uh, of target words that you would like to visualize. So if you wanted to try the China, China Beijing, uh, Tokyo, uh, Japan, Tokyo thing, you could, uh, you could try this as well. Um, and I believe I have an example of this. Um, and this example was unfortunately run on, um, because I did this uh, just, sorry, that is not working. Um, because I did this uh, just before class started, I only have one iteration of, uh, of this uh, working. But um, we have this uh, word, we have these word vectors, which you cannot see at all. <laughs> and then if we, uh, if we zoom, 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 zoom. Sorry, this, P this PNG file is like gigantic. I think it's, uh, I forget the dimensionality, but, uh, ah. <laughs> and you can see Arabia and uh, Colombia and creativity are very close. So apparently, <laughs> <laughs> apparently countries and creativity are close. But um, uh, this, is, as I said, this is only one iteration of word vector training. And probably if you did more, if you did more data, you'd get uh, something that looked a little bit better. Uh, but, but hey, that's, that's what you get. Um, so you can use that if you want to play around with this uh, at all uh, to visualize any embeddings that you learned or, or something. Um, any other uh, questions or comments or stuff? Yeah. Okay. Oh uh, yeah, sorry. Will you give me a just brief overview of what TSA includes? Okay. So basically, um, its objective, what it's trying to do, is you have a you have a probabilistic model um, where things um, where each point has a Gaussian distribution around it. And the, the point gives a probability to each of the words, or, or each, of the, each of the vectors. And because, so similar words will have a higher probability according to that distribution. And what it tries to do is it, you have your two-dimensional space that you want to map things on. And it tries to move things close in the two-dimensional space to maximize the probability uh, based on, like, uh, to maximize the probability based on um, that Gaussian distribution in the high-dimensional space. So if you get things that give each other a high probability in the high-dimensional space, close together in the low-dimensional space, then you'll get a bonus. And it's doing an optimization problem to solve that. Um, you, you can you can take a look at the details. I um, I probably shouldn't say any more to prevent myself from saying it. I know that's correct, but I won't prevent myself from saying anything <laughs> uh, more uh, uh, incorrect about that. So. Um, so, but one one thing is that you should be careful when using uh, nonlinear uh, when using nonlinear uh, projections. And this. Um, uh, this citation is a citation at something called distill.pub, which is this kind of like online, uh, online visualization or journal with visualization type thing. And it's actually a very nice uh, link if you uh, want to take a look at it. But basically, there's a bunch of reasons why you should be careful when using uh, this type of visualization also. Um, so one is that the settings really matter. So if you set this, uh, this perplexity term, basically, uh, to go from a certain value to a certain value, you can see you get a radically different visualization. If you, uh, sorry. Um, also, linear correlations cannot be interpreted 
Um, so if you look at something like this, you can see you start out with two lines, um, which seems very, very, uh, it seems like it should still be two lines after you do visualization, but after, uh, after you run it through Tisney, you might get a few things that are split up. You might get one line and another line like that. You might get curved things. You might get a helix even. That's pretty impressive. Um, or, or you might get something that looks like two lines. So um, one thing is that if you remember before, I saw um, I did the, uh, the kind of like king uh, and then queen uh, and then kings and then queens thing. You can do this with a low dimensional projection or uh, a linear projection like PCA, but you can't do this with a, a linear projection like Tisney, a nonlinear projection like Tisney. So when you're writing figures in your paper and you see a really nice linear, uh, linear correlation in your Tisney plot, it actually doesn't mean anything. So don't, uh, don't try to interpret it that way. Okay. Um, so then we also have intrinsic evaluation of embeddings. So there's a, a nice paper by uh, Schnabel et al. Um, or uh, yeah, Schnabel et al. Um, and it's uh, it basically categorizes various types of uh, of uh, evaluation metrics for embeddings. And one is relatedness. So relatedness is the correlation between the embedding's uh, cosine similarity and some human evaluation of similarity. So if the two words have high cosine similarity, they should be similar in human evaluation. And uh, if they have low cosine similarity, they should not be similar. And this is measured according to your standard correlation uh, coefficients like Pearson's or Spearman's or something like that. Another is analogy tasks. So A is to B as X is to Y. So uh, king is to wo uh, woman is to king as uh, man is to x uh, or something like that. Um, so finding the appropriate word. Um, categorization, you can create clusters based on the embeddings and measure the purity of the clusters. Or uh, there's also selectional preference. I think this is a little bit more minor. But you can say that this particular verb uh, gets a noun. Uh, um, this particular verb takes these sorts of nouns as its subject or object. And uh, if, uh, if that's right, then you, you get points. If it's wrong, then you don't get points. Um, so extrinsic evaluation, using word embeddings in systems. Uh, this is actually probably what we care about more, but it's a lot harder to do and a lot more, uh, a lot more system specific. So, um, there's lots of ways you can use word embeddings in systems, uh, but maybe the probably the most common two are uh, you take your parsing model. Um, if you have a parsing model, you take your um, your pre-trained word embeddings and you use them to initialize your uh, your word embeddings in your model. The second one is you can concatenate them together. So you take your pre-trained word embeddings and you concatenate them uh, to other embeddings that you learn. Um, and these have disadvantages. Um, oh, wow, I didn't finish my sentence, I apologize. <laughs> um, so uh, these both have advantages. Um, concatenating embeddings has the advantage that you don't change anything um, of the embeddings that you've already learned. So you could think about, if you think about the reason why you normally use word embeddings in the first place, it's because you have words that weren't covered by your training data for your parser or your part of speech tag or whatever. So you get this really nice embedding space where you have beautiful, beautiful PCA, beautiful clusters, uh, everything looks nice. And then suddenly you train on your parsing data where only this part of your clusters are actually included in the parsing data. So this is, not this is not a great idea, right? Because if, or if you initialize with this, then suddenly what happens is this moves in this direction, this moves in this direction, and this moves in this direction, um, because that's what's better for parsing. But all the other word embeddings that weren't in your parsing data, these all get left out. They are suddenly not consistent with, uh, with the things you learned. Um, so concatenation helps solve this, because you concatenate things, and then you don't change them at all. 
Um, but you can still learn, you know, uh, specific embeddings that might be, uh, that might help out with the things that are useful. Um, so, any questions about this? Or, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so the but the but is it increases your parameter space. Yes, that's that's the but. Yeah. Um, okay. So next, how do I choose embeddings? Let's say you have your uh, your wonderful glove embeddings. You have your wonderful uh, your wonderful word -to -vec embeddings and your wonderful fast text embeddings, and then uh, whatever other embeddings you can find. So the answer here is that I don't know. Um, I can't give you any recommendations, and probably nobody can give you good recommendations. And the reason why is basically because it's extremely task dependent. Um, so let's say you trained word to vec with uh, a short context window. That might work very well for parsing, uh, but not for semantic tasks because you get synt syntactic embeddings. But if you train word to vec with a big context window, that might work uh, very well for semantic tasks, but not uh, syntactic tasks. So. We have an example here. Uh, this, uh, this is also from this paper. And basically, SIBO was great for, uh, for a lot of the kind of intrinsic evaluation measures of word embeddings that are mostly semantic. But um, if you do chunking, um, was chunking covered in algorithms for NLP at all or no? So chunking is basically like, um, it's like shallow parsing. So you're looking for noun phrases, verb phrases, and stuff. This is a syntactic task. And for the syntactic task, completely different embeddings were, were more helpful. So um, really, you can have better embeddings by having better data, bigger data, or something like that. But in the end, you, the features that you um, are, they're going to depend on the task. So you need to be aware of this and pick the one that you think is, uh, is best for whatever you're going to be doing. And finally, when are pre-trained embeddings be, uh, being useful? When should you go through the, um, the trouble of using pre-trained embeddings in your models? Um, basically, when training data uh, for your core task that you care about is not enough. So um, they're very useful for tagging, uh, parsing, text classification. So uh, there's many, many stories about them being useful here. Um, they're less useful for machine translation. Um, few people have reported good results here. Um, and basically, they shouldn't be useful for language modeling. And the reason why they shouldn't be useful for language modeling is because you have the same data for language modeling and training your embeddings. Language models are trained on, uh, are trained on plain text, so are word embeddings. So uh, you know, theoretically, you shouldn't be getting uh, very much of a bonus from doing this, unless you get some bonus from uh, from learning two tasks. <laughs> yeah. So I'm a little confused. What's the quantitative me measurement of uh, how good a word embedding is? Okay. Um, is so there yeah. Anything that's you know having a score like a blue score, a counterpart to MT, where you have uh -huh. you know intrinsic and extrinsic measurement, which is perplexity versus blue score, things like that. Uh -huh. but to me. It's a little vague, like how do you intrinsically and explicitly okay. measure it? So for, first to clarify, for MT, uh, for MT, perplexity and blue score are both intrinsic metrics of the MT accuracy. Um, perplexity is not a very good one. Blue is a better one. Um, an extrinsic measure of MT accuracy would be using MT in a cross-lingual information retrieval system, or using MT to help uh, middle school students pass their English tests. Um, and then if you did that, then that would be an extrinsic metric. So, so um, uh, in blue and perplexity are both measures of how well you're doing it uh, in, at MT. So these are the intrinsic met metrics of uh, word embedding usefulness. If you really care about finding analogies, um, then maybe this could be considered an intrinsic, uh, extrinsic metric, but these are usually considered intrinsic. And then extrinsic ones are parsing accuracy, chunking accuracy, uh, things for some other task that you care about, but not, uh, are not actually in that. So. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Uh, what is the difference between the selection preference and uh, guessing the words 
given the context? Oh, so selectional preference is something basically entirely different. It's deciding whether a particular word can be a subject or object of a particular verb. So I, um, does that make sense? Uh, actually, more personally, um, yeah. I want to know whether, I want to know why the guessing the word given context is not a intrinsic evaluation of the Okay, so guessing the word guessing the word given the context is a, a problem of language modeling, and that is it's not used to um, to measure the accuracy of embeddings. Uh, and probably the reason why it's not used is because word embeddings are not very useful in language modeling tasks. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. <laughs> um, so I will, uh, I will move on to, oh, sorry, went too far. Okay, so um, this is the last section. This is not covered by the reading materials at all. Um, this is kind of a survey of the different ways uh, that people uh, tend to use uh, or to, would like to improve embeddings and make them better for whatever purpose you want to do. Um, so number one, um, hang on one second. So number one, is basically um, we have a number of limitations for embeddings that we would like to fix. And all of these models are basically created to fix one of these limitations. So number one is embeddings are sensitive to superficial differences. So the superficial differences are, are things like dog and dogs. Um, we, on the other hand, they're also insensitive to context. So this is kind of the opposite of the thing of superficial differences. So there's no superficial difference between this bank and the other bank in their uh, surface form. Uh, but financial bank and bank of a river are very uh, different. Um, another thing is they're not necessarily coordinated with knowledge or coordinated across languages. Um, they're not interpretable. Uh, so. Um, you can do PCA, but make the each individual dimension of the uh, of the word embedding might not make uh, might not mean anything. And also, they can encode uh, bias, such as stereotypical gender roles or racial biases, for example. Um, so one way to oh sorry, go ahead. Um, that, that's, a, that's a good point. I will talk about that maybe after I talk about the ways that people do normally. So, um, uh, oh, the question was whether you can pre-process the data to remove the superficial differences. So um, the way people try to, um, try to basically smooth over these small differences in words is by doing some sort of subword um, sub embedding. Um, so one, maybe the first way that people uh, tried to do this within the neural prediction-based frameworks anyway, is uh, morpheme-based models. So they had this nice, uh, they had this nice model uh, where they had this uh, recursive tree structure, the model of morphology, um, where you split it up into unfortunate, and then you combine them into unfortunate. And then you split, had unfortunate and Lee, and you combine them into unfortunate Lee. So it was kind of this recursive neural network uh, model. Um, so this was in 2013. And then in 2015, we have uh, character-based models. So what these character-based models do is basically they split each word into characters. So it says cats up there. And then you run a bidirectional LSTM recurrent neural network over these uh, to calculate uh, the characters. I'm, Going to talk about recurrent neural networks later, but basically it's a, a character-based model where you uh, where you do something like this. So this was in 2015, and then very recently in uh, in 2017, there was a bag of character engrams model uh, used to re represent words. So we, if we have where, basically we we split it up into W H W H E H E R E R E R E. And instead of using a one-hot embedding for the word, we use a kind of n-hot embedding that counts these character engrams. Um, so this is, uh, this is the method behind, um, uh, and it used engrams from three to six plus the word itself. 
This is used in the fast text uh, toolkit by Facebook. Um, so I think the consensus is that um, basically some sort of subword information is useful. It allows you to uh, generalize to low frequency words. It allows you to, uh, to calculate values for unknown words. Um, one interesting thing is we started out with a really nice linguistically motivated model, and then we gradually regressed to bag of character engrams. <laughs> so now we have this, uh, this model that has no sort of composition uh, or whatever. Um, but this seems to work pretty well. Um, most importantly, it's simple and fast. So I, I think this is a, a good choice if you want to train things on big, uh, big amounts of data. Um, I'd probably recommend using this instead of word to vec or, or glove or anything like that, just uh, because often you'll want, um, you'll want embeddings for words that weren't in your training data, and this can give you them. Um, any, any questions so far? Yeah. So the the subword model. Um, so maybe where where is not a great example. This would be this is the example that was in the paper. But probably a better example would be a long word like decide, and then you have decided. So if you think about that, many of the character engrams in Decide and Decided are going to be the same. So you start out with something that's very similar. Uh, and hopefully that will help you generalize is the, the motivation. Um, of course, probably a recursive neural network over morphology will do an even better job of allowing you to do that. But uh, that requires a lot of linguistic resources. And it might be slower. So you couldn't calculate it on uh, lots of languages. Yeah. Um, I, I think probably. So, um, let's see. So this uh, this model on the right is a bidirectional LSTM, and bidirectional LSTMs do better at everything if you uh, give them enough training data. No, I, I'm I'm joking. Don't uh, <laughs> don't quote me on that. But bidirectional LSTMs are a very strong model that can learn lots of complicated things. Um, but the problem is they're kind of slow, and they're going to be much slower than uh, the bag of character engrams things. So if you can train the bag of character engrams on a hundred times more training data because it's fast and parallelizable or something then that might be a better choice. But I think if you had lots of data, lots of uh, kind of like a, a big network or something like that, the one on the right might do a better job. But I don't have any empirical evidence for that either. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, um, both methods are good. We have other methods uh, for doing that for machine translation, which I might talk about a bit more uh, later, but yeah. OK, so that's the subword thing. The second one, this is the opposite problem, where you have words where the surface form is the same, uh, but you want, to calculate, uh, you want to calculate basically different meanings for them. So this is an example. This was actually from the uh, kind of count-based paradigm before the predict, uh, the predict paradigm. But um, this is uh, called multi-prototype embeddings. And basically what you do is um, each word is uh, split into a particular cluster. Um, so you might have four clusters for uh, the word position because you know there are four senses for the word position in your dictionary or something like that. And then each time you, uh, you do some sort of adjustment, you first decide which cluster it belongs to, and then, um, and then kind of split up uh, or optimize based on uh, the cluster assignment. Um, there was also a paper in 2014 uh, that does this in a non-parametric way, so you don't have to choose the number of clusters in advance. And basically what it does is it finds out whether it looks like this word is in a context similar to the places where you've already seen it. And if the answer is yes, then it will put it in that cluster. If the answer is no, then it will, uh, it will create a new cluster for it. So um, this is useful for solving the problem of, uh, of having only one embedding for each word. Um, 
So the second, um, another thing is that uh, embeddings might not be necessarily be coordinated with something that you want. Um, one example of wanting things to be coordinated is where you want things coordinated across, uh, across languages. So let's say you want to do parsing in, uh, in 50 languages. Um, so there, there's a dependency parsing over, uh, I forget how many languages, but over a lot of languages task at Connell uh, this year, um, where you basically have lots of, uh, lots of data in some languages, so you can learn a good parser for them, but you have very little data or very few data in other languages. So in that case, you might want to use word embeddings to kind of help you generalize, but it doesn't work very well if your word embeddings are in a completely different space for different languages. So this method basically, um, it uses a uh, method called CCA. So you pre-train your word embeddings in both languages using a large corpus uh, of monolingual data. Then after that, you take a translation dictionary and you say, okay, this word and this word in, this, uh, in each language mean the same thing. And then you try to learn transformation matrices to ensure that the words that are translations of each other go to the same, uh, go to the same place. Um, and <clears throat> if you do this, you get embeddings that mean the same thing across different languages. Um, and it also has the auxiliary nice effect of improving your monolingual embeddings as well. So um, your monolingual embeddings get better from this um, multilingual supervision. Um, there was actually an interesting paper at ACL this year where they, instead of taking a full translation dictionary, they basically just took the numerals, um, yeah, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and learned a transformation matrix from that, and it still helped, which was kind of a, a shocking result, but it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. I don't think that's on the references, but I'll try to add it later. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's this. Uh, what? Yeah. What are the authors? Of the other paper, um, I'm, I'm sorry. I'll have to look that up uh, <laughs> and add it to the. I'll, I'll try to add it to the page and also mention it on Piazza as well. Um, and any, any other questions? Okay, so this is another paper. Uh, it's very, very much in the same uh, in the same vein as uh, the one that I talked about before. But um, I started out uh, talking about this, um, or I started out this lecture with uh, WordNet, which is this very nice lexical resource that has lots of human effort, very high precision, uh, et cetera. And we would like to be able to use this resource. Um, this paper was actually best paper at NACL uh, um, 2015 or 16 or something like that by Manal Farakui, who's here, who was here at CMU at the time, and he had this nice, uh, this nice picture of Chris Dyer and Ed Hovey fighting over Chris Dyer likes word embeddings and Ed Hovey likes lexicons, so we need to reconcile them so they don't have to fight anymore. But, um, but regardless of that, it's a it's a nice uh, a nice paper, um, and uh, the, but basically the idea is that we have these uh, links. Between, uh, between the words, et cetera. And we would like our word embeddings to be respecting uh, the direction of these links. And we use a, a similar method uh, of learning linear projections that basically turn, uh, turn our word vectors into a space where uh, if you follow a link, it will be consistent with this. And there's a bunch of other methods uh, that I'll probably talk about later about like learning knowledge bases from word embeddings that follow this same kind of general trend. Um, so, one other thing that I, uh, I mentioned was a problem was that word embeddings are not necessarily interpretable. Um, that might not necessarily be a problem if you just like to use them, uh, but sometimes you would like to kind of know what's going on under the hood. Um, one way to kind of solve this problem and make them more interpretable is by doing sparse embeddings. Um, so there's a number of methods to do this. Um, the, uh, so one, one example uh, from kind of the count-based framework, and there's a couple other examples from the prediction-based framework, is you add some sort of uh, sparsity constraint uh, to 
which will try to force most of the dimensions in the embedding to be zero. And if you force most of the dimensions in the embedding to be zero, basically you hope that each individual embedding, uh, each individual dimension of the embedding will have more information because the ones that are active will have to encode some information about the word. Um, and this specifically, this, uh, this paper specifically did both sparse and, uh, and positive. So kind of like a negative, a negative feature doesn't make a lot of sense, uh, is harder to interpret than a positive feature. Uh, so this, uh, this paper did this. And they made the embeddings very, very large. Uh, they made the embeddings, I, I think it was uh, like four times larger than the, uh, than the dense embeddings in order to take account for the fact that most were zero. And uh, uh, three times larger, I'm sorry. Um, so if you look at the SVD-based uh, learned embeddings uh, with 300 dimensions, and you pick random dim uh, dimensions and list the words on the dimensions, you get things that don't really mean a whole lot, like well, long, if, year, watch, plan, engine, e, rock, a very. Um, but if you do the non-negative non sparse embedding, you get things like inhibitor, inhibitors, antagonists, receptors, inhibition, uh, Bristol, Fame, Southampton, Brighton, Pool. So things that actually make sense on each, uh, each dimension. And this is a final one. This is something that a lot of people have been, uh, I guess, interested in recently, which is when we have our AI-based systems and our AI-based systems are making very real decisions about our lives, like whether to give you a loan or something like that. Uh, we want to be very sure that it is not doing something evil. Um, so uh, this is just one example um, of how we, uh, how we do something like that. Um, and basically the idea is that word embeddings reflect bias in statistics. Um, so if we have a bias statistic, um, we might have word embeddings that basically come up with things like um, she, if you look at she and he, and you look at the occupation-based words for each of these, it comes up with things like homemaker, nurse, receptionist, etc., for female, and maestro, skipper, protege, philosopher for male. And this is obviously not, you know, or I, I think it's obviously not a good thing uh, if we're forcing, basically forcing occupations on people based on our data. Uh, so, the idea here is basically that we would like to essentially um, well, essentially neutralize uh, something like this so uh, we can make more uh, fair decisions. And so what they did here was they come up with, uh, with basically things that are kind of undisputably gender appropriate. So brother and sister are, you know, they're the words that you use for male and female siblings, queen and king, uh, waitress, waiter, etc. And these, um, these things are used to learn the, like, the gender dimension, and then the other things, um, so, and then the other things, uh, we tr they try to uh, neutralize, uh, neutralize them, so they don't uh, vary along this dimension, but they can vary along all the other dimensions. Um, I don't know if this is the final answer to doing something like this uh, methodologically, but it, I think it's an important thing to think about when you're building a system, is your system inadvertently discriminating against people uh, because that's what the data told it to do. So um, this is a, a very interesting case study of that, I think. So yeah, that's all uh, for today. Are there any uh, questions or discussions? Or stuff? Yeah. Can you talk more about this slide how So, <clears throat> I think you, you should definitely read the paper to make sure I'm not uh, summarizing it in an in a incorrect way. But basically, you can calculate a direction um, that is the direction of he and she, the direction of king and queen, the direction of sister and brother. And that's like the, the stereotypical or the the prototype vector for male and female differences, I guess. Um, and then they basically do a projection of the other pairs so they don't vary along that, uh, along that dimension. Um, 
as I said, this is not the only way to do this, and there's probably much uh, uh, better ways that don't require you to prepare these pairs, uh, et cetera. Um, like, uh, we, we had a paper where you had an adversarial objective over your, uh, um, over your uh, embeddings or uh, encodings or something like that that uh, helped uh, prevent this as well. Um, but uh, this paper is a very interesting example of this anyway, so you can take a look. Uh, yeah. uh, what, what's the current Um, I, the, there's a lot of subjectivity in that, um, but I would say as a good baseline, you should use fast text. So fast text uh, is is very nice uh, in that it uses subwords. It's fast. It's easy to run on large corpora. Um, it doesn't do stuff like con uh, like ensuring that things are consistent between languages, for example. So you might have to do something in addition. But if you just want something out of the box that works, that'd probably be a good one. Yeah, I think software is pretty cool for the classification. I don't know whether it's also good for the sequential tasks, like the machine translation. Um, well, subwords are good for machine translation. Um, I don't think people do pre-training of embeddings for machine translation very often for the reason that I mentioned before, uh, which is that we have lots of training data. Um, but I think they're probably good for semantic tasks, and they're probably better for syntactic tasks, actually. So, yeah. yeah. So for Manalo's 2015, the NACL paper yeah. with WordNet, um, yeah. since WordNet's coverage is not enormous, would it suffer from the problem that you mentioned on the board there, where words outside of that so that, that's, a, that's a very good question. And actually, that's one of the very nice things about uh, this method here. So um, I didn't explain this figure very uh, very closely, but basically. Well, the word uh, and they're using similar, they're using similar methods. Okay. So uh, you'll notice here we have the sigma, um, sigma dash and uh, omega dash. Mm -hmm. And these are the ones that are actually aligned. Uh, between the languages, and there's only a subset. Uh, there are only a subset of all the word embeddings in the language. But you're learning a linear projection, and then you're projecting all the embeddings. So that linear projection is consistent across the entire language. So um, a, a similar method is being used in the um, in the WordNet paper, and uh, that's why it's still okay. a good idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for this paper, there was another one written by Kuros at the same time doing uh -huh. visual semantic embedding. That was not using CCA, but it's using mm -hmm. um, pairwise vector loss. Uh -huh. So that turns out the I've used this for image to text, mm -hmm. but the results are very similar. Is that something interesting? Along so, the way, or so the results of the training method are very similar, or the results of the two different like mm -hmm. without CCA or the pairwise vector loss, right? They, they turn out to be very similar. In yeah, so I, I think, as I mentioned at the very beginning and was also mentioned in the book, the actual method that you use to solve the problem, uh, the actual numerical method that you use to solve the problem is often not, doesn't make a big difference in the results compared to the actual problem you're trying to solve. So whether it's CCA or pairwise ranking loss or uh, linear, uh, learning a linear projection matrix uh, or something like that, I think it might be more important to n have an intuition of the problem you're solving versus the actual exact method that you use to solve it. So I, I don't know if that answers the question. But, uh, yeah. It's a good way. To <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, looks like there's no more questions. So uh, yeah, thank you, everybody. <laughs>